Ethan Bach was living as a fairly normal teenager. Sure, he might have played too many video games and he was exposed to porn at a very young age and he's seen his fair share of violent films. But it wasn't until he was diagnosed with a brain tumor that he slipped into and was prescribed as having a steroid psychosis at age 18. So he was trying to recover from this horrible situation with a brain tumor, go to college, have girlfriends, but soon it was hard for him to deal emotionally. And he turned to more of the darkness that was lurking and waiting for him. And that was the drinking and the weed and the spice and the porn. And soon he went into what we're gonna talk about today, which is four more psychotic episodes, each one getting crazier than the next. And some of them we can label as the Truman Show delusion. Now I am happy to say he is sitting here with me today because he is writing a book about his experiences. He's on medication, he's sober, and ladies, he's single. Great to have you on the show, <laughs> Ethan. <laughs> hey, glad to be here, Kim. So what's the number one driver for you to write your book? Like, why did you call me up? Uh, I called you up because I just want to share my story with everyone. I feel like, I mean, on a grander scale, yeah, but also just my, my personal family and friends don't, they don't really know what it's been like to be in my mind for the last 11, 10 years. And now look at that experience. And they'll get to see you like, holy crap. Right. So you you have two objectives. One is to give the people that have been around you for all these years an insight into, because it's, from what I understand from your story and, you know, you're already in your second draft. So you've laid a lot of it out on the table is that there was a lot going on for you internally that a lot of people didn't see, right? So like your parents were the ones that would get you to like, you know, the mental facilities or get you to the places you need to go, but they weren't really privy to some of the stuff that was going on in your head. And we're going to get into that a little bit. We've talked a lot about how, you know, many people are out there having psychotic breaks and it's not really talked about. Why do you think that is? Why do you think it's not talked about? It's just, I mean, it's a, I don't want to say I guess that's the only word I can think of is bloody process. It's like slugging punches here and there, the whole psychosis, because everyone's is different and everyone's is horrible and it affects their families and any friends that are involved. And just nobody likes to be dragged down by that, I guess. Um, yeah. <laughs> Do you think there's, do you think there's a, 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 like a shame element behind it? A little bit, yeah. Um, nobody wants to be seen, I guess, talking or fraternizing with someone who's had the psychosis or has schizoaffective disorder like me. Um, it's just seen as something that's negative and you know everything's positive in society like you know you turn on the tv every commercial everyone's bright smiling <laughs> everything's fine with the world fun and dandy you know and that's that's how it is it's interesting because it's almost like people don't want to be with someone who's crazy and yet which is just a terrible word to use, right? But yet when someone's being honest that they've had psychotic breaks and then they're on medication, they know the triggers like weed, porn, you talk about all this in your book, alcohol, all the addictions, right? That it just, it's hard to not, to get out of a psychotic break when you're completely deluged by outside, you know, addictions. But, you know, there's so many people out there that are completely nuts. <laughs> we don't know about, right? Like, yeah. I'd almost rather be with you because I know what I'm going to get, which I'm really, <laughs> you know, than someone who's going to like flip out on me. Um, so your psychotic breaks involve this Truman Show delusion, which I think you discovered when you read a book about it by an author called Eric Gold. What was his name, Eric? Ian and Joel Gold. I think they're brothers. 
Okay. And did you, so tell us a little bit about this Truman Show delusion that you had. Well, it's basically, if you've seen that movie, it's, it's like the movie. You think you're in some sort of bubble and there's a TV show that surrounds you with cameras always on you, secret cameras. There's everyone you come into contact with is acting for the TV show. And, you know, there's a director or producer somewhere telling them to say certain lines or um, one time I got punched by a nurse. And the reason for that was because I, w I thought I was doing takes. I kept coming at him. And when he pushed me away, it was like, oh, okay, take two, let's go again. And, I, and you know, he punched me finally. But uh, <laughs> that's basically what it is in a nutshell. And, you know, you were a child actor. And as we mentioned before, you have a great love of film. You've actually been to school here and there to study film. You actually like audio. Mm -hmm. And do you think it's coincidental? I mean, it can't be that you went naturally to this kind of psychosis. Do you think it was the influence of all that? Yeah, definitely. Um, like with the psychosis. I'm, I've been reading some of my journal entries recently on it, and you can see movie quotes in there, and certain different characters from movies are put in, and it's just ridiculous. And then there's the zombie factor, right? Yeah. So, you know, being your book coach, I've been privy to reading the really detailed and really extensive accounts that you've put on paper of some of these breaks, and the one that really really stood out to me was the zombie one where you felt like you could hear your your family's bodies stacking up outside the door and your dogs and your pets and the zombies were just eating them it's almost like an acid trip yeah i mean in the most horrible way yeah in the in a very not fun way <laughs> and it goes on all i mean you just lay in your bed and just believe that the whole world has gone into this apocalypse in your mind, you know? And it's interesting because that's a break. You know what I mean? That's what they yeah. say. Like, like you're, you've taken a break from, from reality. Um, you know, we talked a little bit in the book about, you know, sex and love addiction. There is this one particular woman that you kind of like, latched on to early on um really kind of maybe because it was like your first love tell me a little bit about the pain how painful it was that she kept coming back to you in these various psychoses in all five of them actually well yeah i mean at the time during my during my psychosis um <laughs> it was very traumatic you know thinking that I was somehow with her or like we were somehow secretly married and I'd have to go rescue her from being kidnapped by someone or the show was making this episode out to be Ethan finds the woman um right but then afterwards and after I got would get a little bit better from my psychosis then yeah it would it would come kind of crashing down just like that's pathetic man and that's all I can think about yeah yeah it feels bit like you know when what happened the obsessions of our mind you know are really intense that without logic they can latch on to this you know one person you know yeah um how were the mental facilities you were in? Because you were in a variety. You were in a fair amount um, over the course of five psychoses. And, you know, you write about a few of them. <laughs> You're one of them. One of them. <laughs> I mean, you, you just held up a, uh, a, what do you call that? A medical, medical. Bracelet. Intake, intake bracelet. Yeah. There were the state run and then there were the private. Tell me a little bit about the differences between those two and some of the things that you saw oh man okay uh which one do you want first just give me the give me the worst first the worst was a state run for sure it was it felt like there was no organization it was just it was just 20 30 people like crammed in a room like sardines 
and I arrived there like 2 a.m. and it was just people just sleeping on the floors all over the place and um I I remember I saw in one room there was a guy just struggling with his straight jacket and they locked had him locked in that room and um the only structured kind of thing that I saw there was that you know there was a little breakfast time but it was kind of crappy breakfast um and we got like here here's your like fun time it was like a, a little box full of like I don't know five books and like a few little game things or puzzles and that was it and like I didn't stay there for longer than one day because I it's a long story but um I was just thinking how could you be in there that long and and be that close to other people that are going through the same thing Mm -hmm. and also be sleeping in there that even that's got to make a normal person go insane too yeah it seems like it would just make someone crazier yeah it would make someone crazier and then you went into uh private facilities uh because you know part of this is that you were fortunate to have parents who did you know have the means and did care enough to you know be there with you along the way through a lot of this these amazing incidences so what was the what were the nice ones like the nice ones um well when i was in psychosis they didn't feel nice at all so (laughs) everything was just dark shadows everywhere and stuff but afterwards i could recollect and see how it was a organized place there were every day has something happening right after something is done you know this meeting after this meeting is meditation after meditation is lunch and then another meeting and then snack time and then another meeting then movie time um and you know they always have different types of therapies they have occupational therapy with our kind of arts and crafts the type things and the music therapy and uh you know it, it still varies some um you could actually in the last one i went to uh you could actually get an ipod and have a pandora account on there not your own it's it's the facilities mm-hmm. and you get your own he- pair of headphones and you can listen to pandora that's very and nice. that and that's like a godsend in one of those right. places right because you want to you want to get some peace from the 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 noises and the sounds and people that are yes in, in a terror terrible state and then um so i want to just go back to porn for a minute um we we talk a fair amount in the book about your early exposure to pornography and you know you've spent the last what is it like 60 something days making efforts to get off your addiction to porn and you've done a really good job with that um do you think porn was an escape for you in terms of um when you were out of the psychotic break you would go back to it or do you think it shaped the kinds of partners that you looked for? Um, I think it definitely shapes the kind of partners you look for. I did read a book called um, Your Brain on Porn by Gary Wilson, I think. Mm -hmm. And it talks about this in there where your, your mind isn't meant to take that amount of stimulus in as much as porn shows and so when your brain gets shown that porn you obviously get excited and stuff really like a lot and then it wants more something more novelty and then you so you go from this porn to that porn different types you know things you wouldn't normally find you're upping the bar like you're yeah and bar. it could go That's against that. your morals it could yeah. just wrong and so that's what I really found in 
some of the partners I seeked out. Um, I don't know if you want to talk about which ones or. Well, no, I mean, I what, what I found fascinating is that at a young age, you really went, you took a deep dive into places that I think a lot of people, and I could be naive on this, but a lot of people would be scared of meeting partners on Craigslist or knowing the lingo or, you know, I guess they do hookups now on like, you know, apps, but this is like, you know, you really met a lot of different types of people, you know, different genders, you know. Yeah. Um, and this and is were, in like 2011 you, to 2024 or, or not. Well, well we're like, not there yet. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 2018. Right. And you were out there um, really. Um, and, and I would say, I don't want to discredit anybody that is sexually exploratory but you know I think with the imbalances that you were dealing with with like having a psychotic break wanting to be you know in a sane state doing smoking a lot of weed drinking a lot of alcohol having a lot of these sort of anonymous partners I don't know if you could ever catch up yeah I mean I wasn't doing myself any favors with that yeah. It was it was just all to do, dole the pain, and uh, from the traumas I'd experienced, and and I'm just so happy I'm off now. I mean, off yeah. weed and alcohol, and my mind is so clear, and just I can set goals and achieve them, and actually study on things, and it feels good. And write a book. Yeah, that too. So one thing I thought was really cool in the book, what you're doing is it's, it's a memoir, but it's also like you have some stands that you take about some of these topics we're talking about, about how dangerous weed can be for a young mind, porn, spice, which I had never really even heard of. But you also talk about nutrition playing a role in your mental health. Tell us a little bit more about what you've learned. Um, what I've learned is... Uh, there's a study called the China study and basically it took study participants all, all throughout China, rural China, very rural China, and found that they all had very good nutrition because they were all eating natural vegetables and fruits, whatever they grow. And almost none of them or a very low amount of them had, you know, cancers or other diseases that most of us in western society get used to hearing about um so what i took that to mean was that maybe even my brain tumor itself like what started all this could have partly been my fault because of just eating like crap up until i was like 20 um and yeah and just candy and every time i get some sort of burger or anything anything with a chance of having salad or cabbage on it nope getting plain so that's that's what he used to do (laughs) i think it's i mean these are all like great topics you know to dive into on a you know on a deeper level i mean there's so many conversations to be to be had with people um you're 30 years old you've got your whole life ahead of you um you spoke at one point though about feeling like ending your life tell us a little bit about that moment um um there's actually a few different parts (laughs) okay but Give us, give us the one with, with, I think you found your dad, there was a gun in the house or a B, but it was a BB gun. Oh yeah. This, this, I, I don't think I was in psychosis yet, but I was maybe getting there. Um, yeah. And that was just, I felt so down about my newfound disabilities for my tumor. You know, there's my normal arm. Here's my part of my disability. I'm also disabled in my legs. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, I was feeling so down about that. And I was trying to get a surgeon on the East Coast to do a surgery on my, 
you know, where, where my brain tumor was, which was about the deepest that could be in the brain. So no surgeon wanted to touch it, but this guy said he would. And my parents wouldn't let me. And I don't know, I was just devastated. And I, I guess I couldn't see a way out of it. And I just felt so down. And yeah, I, I thought of many different ways to do it and was looking up different ways online to do it. But most of the places I, I found, most of the things I found were, they were too like painful or I just yeah. imagine, imagine, I know it still sounds weird trying to kill yourself, but um so that's why the only the only way I could, thought about it was once I found the BB gun, but it really did look like a real gun and it was heavy and everything. Mm -hmm. um, I did put it to my head and pull the trigger. Thank God it was a BB gun. Um, because that's quick, right? Right. Um, right. That's giving it's giving up. Right. And if you had been able to follow through on the suicide you wouldn't be here today you wouldn't be able to be an advocate out in the world for people where do you see your book bringing you in the future what are some of the hopes and dreams you can now have now that you've surmounted a lot of this you know physical i don't want to discount the brain tumor and the disabilities that you have today but also the mental what do you hope to do I hope to be seen as a warrior for mental health and uh, different facets of that with the addictions and whatnot. And for more selfishly sort of, I would hope for maybe it to be uh, made into a movie or some sort of documentary maybe even. Um, yeah, I have a blank. <laughs> or a TED talk or yeah TED talk uh, or also being a traveling uh you know giving speeches and stuff at the universities yes. that sort of thing yes well I see big things for you happening I'm really excited about what's coming forth in your book and I want to thank you so much for taking time to speak with us today yeah it's great to be here <laughs>